We're in a series called Spiritual Warfare, um, Spiritual Warfare and Tactics. And listen, everybody, if you don't think you were in a war, we are in a war. And it's in the war, not only what you see, but there are things that are unseen. In fact, what's unseen is more real than what's seen, because what's, un- what's seen right now is temporary. What's unseen is eternal. And so you and I, to navigate this life, we have to understand that we are in a battle. And we've been talking about that. Often what you and I do, I do it all the time. Uh, I get rope doped And if you don't know what rope-a-dope is, uh, great, great, one of the greatest athletes ever was Muhammad Ali. He was, not only was he a great boxer, but he was a showman. The guy was amazing. He was funny. I mean, if you ever want to have a good time, look at him and Howard Cosell. Those guys should go on the road. They're amazing. But what he would do is he would rope dope people. What that simply meant, he would go on the ropes like this, and he and the people would be getting angry, and they let all their energy out, and then they became weak, and he came back in, wham! Okay, and that's what he would do. And often what the enemy does is he rope dopes us. He ropes a dopes us with other things that are not really what we're fighting. Often we shadow box. These things are coming up in our lives, and we're shadow boxing. We're, we're like, I don't know what's going on. It's because we're not fighting the real enemy. The real enemy is not your boss. The real enemy is not the political parties. The real enemy is not your ex or your mother or your father-in-law. The real enemy is the devil. He is, yes, there is an enemy out there, and his, des- his design and desire is to destroy, lie, cheat, and that's what his whole thing's about. Now, do people have responsibility? Yes. But when we fight the spiritual battle first, it gives us greater power and strength otherwise. And we are in a spiritual battle. The Apostle Paul, I've been writing the book of Ephesians. We're ending it up right now. The Apostle Paul is chained to a Roman guard, undeniably like a good pastor. He sees a good illustration, takes advantage of it, and begins to explain the Roman armament and what it means spiritually. And so today we're going to look at what it means to be righteous. When I say the word righteous, okay, when I say, oh, he's so righteous, what, what comes to your mind? You can say it out loud. When I say righteous, what do you think? Go ahead. You can speak. Hold, thank you. Holier than thou, right? How many people love people that are holier than thou? Okay. What are some other words? Oh, he's so righteous. What, what else comes to mind? Arrogant. What? Arrogant. arrogant. Did you say Eric? <laughs> oh, you said arrogant. Okay, I'm going to make sure. Okay, what are some other things that come to mind? All right, give that woman a donut. That, that, Joan, Pauline got it right. Okay, great standing with God. She said the right answer. But the world thinks righteous is like, oh, you're so righteous, right? And it's negative. In fact, we often think this is going on. That, you know, this is the church. Be right, it's not Joe Rogan, looks like him. Be righteous or else. Be righteous. And so we're here, and we're going to be hypocritical. I'm living a, a, sec, a, a secret life behind the scenes, and I'm telling you how to live your life, and this is what people often think. But our culture is living in this self-righteousness. Everyone has their own righteous standard, and if you don't meet my standards, you are a jerk, and I'm against you, and I'm going to cancel you. And so we have a lot of people saying that they're righteous. Everyone walks around with their own standards of what's right and wrong, and they judge other people. Because they have their truth, I have my truth. But, you know, I wanted to encourage you that righteousness is actually an invitation for wholeness. Now, I'm going to get really deep theologically here. I need you to really to hang with me here, okay? Can you, guys, can you guys be all right? We're going to go deep right now. You guys ready? Okay. All right. <laughs> We're going to go back to the holy lock and the three bears. Because if you don't know the story... It's, it's a fictitious story, by the way. It's not in the Bible. Then why you bring it up on Sunday morning? Because I want to really make sure I, everyone gets this. But what happened is you had the three bears, if you remember the story, and they liked their porridge, which was like oatmeal. And it was too hot. So the three bears got up and left and took a walk to where it to cool down. And then Goldilocks goes into the bears' chambers. And what does she do? She tries the first one and says, it's too Okay, you guys are so brilliant and smart. Then she tries the second one, the mother's one. She says, it's but the little baby bear, it was? Okay, right. Chess. It was a righteous bowl of cereal, right? Basically, that's what we have. So in many ways, what it really is, we all want things to be right. We want things to be right. We want the weather to be right. 
We want to be right in our arguments, right? We want to be right with our money. We want to be right with our family. We all desire right. Why? Because God is righteous. Everything God does is perfect. And in us, there is this desire for things that are right. All of us desire to be validated. And many times you and I feel invalid. So we try to make ourselves valid by making our own standards. And so all of us are invalids. And only one that's valid is God. And when he stamps you, you become righteous. So it's a desire innate inside of you and me. We want to be righteous. So as a result of that, we get in our soapboxes and we find the things that we're good at and don't struggle with. And we basically uh, point at other people and say they're wrong. And then they get on their soapbox of what they're good at and they point at you what you're messing up, right? The truth of the matter is there's not one that's righteous. No, not one. So that rightness is something that is inherently inside of you because you're made in the image of God and you are made to be perfect, but sin came. There's a reason why we want things to be just right. So Goldilocks has a lot to teach us today. Ask me, what'd you learn in church today? Well, we did Goldilocks and the three bears. Okay, so I wanna go back and look at this passage of scripture which the Apostle Paul is talking about. We're gonna read it again. And we're going to look at it, and then we're going to break it down to breastplate of righteousness. Here we go. Finally, be strong in what? In Not in your religion. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, have you noticed it's not about you? What? Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on. That is an action. It is a command. Put on the what? Whole armor. Not just the ones you like. I'm talking, put it all on, armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The devil has tricks. We, last week, we spoke about it a little more. You can go back to cornerstonecheshire.com. You can go on Spotify or Apple iTunes and catch up with that, okay, everybody? I'm not gonna go back and talk about it again. But there's spiritual principalities we're talking about right here. For we do not wrestle against your mother-in-law. We do not wrestle against the government. We do not wrestle against your ex or your children or your parents. For we do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. But against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is something in the air. Listen, if we don't get the right thing done, if we got to stop shadow boxing and fight the real battle first, then we can deal with the other issues that are secondary. The first thing that you and I need to fight is a spiritual fight. When the spiritual is in an alignment and you're, you're submitted to God, you and I have tremendous power to fight in the natural. Now, I'm not talking about fighting and taking up arms. I'm talking about beating divorce, beating unforgiveness, beating addictions, right? And, and, and bringing peace and bringing order and bringing health and healing to people and making a difference, making this a better place for Christ and letting people come to know their creator is, loves them and has a desire for them to know him. It's not about getting rich and living the American dream. That's so shallow, by the way. Our, our objective is a lot greater than what's on this earth. So the Bible talks about that. And why? Therefore, okay, as a result of this, how do you do it? He just told us to take up the whole armor of God. Now he says it again. Therefore, take up what? The whole armor. We don't just pick what we want. This is not a buffet line. Uh, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And believe me, every day seems to be evil. And having done all to stand, stand firm, okay? Stand therefore. Sometimes the best thing you can do is get up. Don't give up. Get up. Stand. He says it twice. Stand. I want you to stand. I, I love the, the biblical movie called Rocky. And Rocky Balboa is, gets knocked down by Apollo Creed. And, and all of a sudden, there's Mickey in the side. He says, get up, you son of God. Get up, you son of God. Sometimes you need to get up. The best thing you can do is get up, stand up, don't give up. The difference between winning and losing is the people that lose give up. And the Bible says, don't give up, stand. God is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Stand. It's always right to do the right thing. Don't give up. Keep on standing. Amen. Yeah, 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 okay? You guys remember last week. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness 
and as shoes for, no, notice this is all action verbs. Put on, put on and keep on. Shoes for your feet, having put on the re- uh, readiness given by the gospel of peace and circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Now we start taking up. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now we start taking up the shield of faith when you need it, right? Which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times. Okay, we should always be in a prayerful state of mind. Doesn't mean we're sitting there and not, what are you doing? I'm just praying, I'm just pray. No, you walk around aware that God is with you, that God is with you. I call it walkie-talkie mode, where God's always there. God, how you doing? God, I need help right now, right? Some of you in the way to church this morning, God, help me with my, my spouse, help me with my kids, okay? So just a quick little prayer to God. We need to always be in a mindset that God is with us and around us. It says, praying at all times in the Spirit. And that's why we need to let the Holy Spirit pray inside of us with all prayer and supplications, all these types of prayers. And listen, we're not done yet here. To that end, keep alert with perseverance. Don't give up. The difference between losers and winners is that losers give up. Winners never give up. They just get back up again. Don't give up. If you keep falling in the same sin over and over, don't give up or he will win. Get up and face another day and stand with God and let God empower you through his spirit and through his body. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we're called to be praying for each other. Part of the spiritual warfare is not to live your life alone. There's a reason why the Apostle Paul says Roman soldier. A Roman soldier doesn't do much good without the whole, the whole group of them. The whole platoon together is what's strong. And you and I need each other. I thank God for the people I was able to call on this past week. Thank you for being there. And I'm going through a lot now with my family. I'll talk a little bit later about that. And so we need each other to pray for each other. Sometimes when I'm weak, I need prayer, right? So we all stand together. We pray together. This is why we have small groups coming up. We're not having small groups for only one reason we have them pretty much. So you would get connected to each other that you don't face this life alone. Everyone needs to be a part of a platoon. Everyone needs a brother or sister alongside that will encourage you in the right way because we all get discouraged. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, not one by one. And said, America, it's all about the rugged individualism. No, it's not about that. It's about taking responsibility for yourself, yes, but we're called to be working together in groups in power. So listen, one can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. The persevering, making supplication to all the saints. Stand, Lord, and we go back. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Last week we talked about the, bre- the belt of truth. What's that all about? Well, here's the Roman armament, a depiction of it at least. You have the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. You have the shield of faith. You have the gospel of peace. And you also have the sword of the spirit, which you can't see right here, and the helmet of salvation. Now, we, last week we spoke about the belt of truth and how truth is one of the most, it is the most important armament on the Roman armament soldier. Why? Because it holds everything together. Without the belt being clipped on, there's little clips here. You would clip on the breastplate right onto that truth, and it would hold it in place. Also, it would be, take all the weight. It was about 75 pounds. So anywhere from 45 to 75 pounds the armament was. And so when you had it on your shoulder, you had everything connected correctly, you could bear it. But if you don't have truth there, the belt, it's all discombobulated, and you cannot fight. So it's very important. We talked last week about that. So what is truth? Truth is Jesus. Okay? Truth is not relative. I don't have my truth and your truth. There's only one truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. What's real truth? Facts are not truth. The facts may be true, but it's not truth. Facts plus Jesus equals truth. Because the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together. There is a right way and there's a wrong way in everything that there is. And so what, what do we do? What's our final authority, everybody? If we don't have the, the belt of truth on, nothing else works. And what's the final authority? Scripture. There's an attack upon the Bible right now. We mentioned last week, I have my Jesus, you have your, no. There's only one Jesus, and you can't make him into who you want him to be. No more dashboards Jesuses. There's only one Jesus. And this is what he says, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. He is the I am. And so what is scripture? 
The Bible says the word became flesh. The Bible is that. Now listen, the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, it is supernaturally put together through both the Holy Spirit and God used man and the Holy Spirit to work together. The Bible you can trust. It is the most amazing book that ever was or ever shall be. The more I read it, the more I'm amazed by it. And we did a study about it. You can trust the Bible. You can know that it's the word of God. People today are saying, well, you know, we're going to change it. No, there's one way, there's one truth, and there's one life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus, and Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and the Bible is our final authority. I don't have time to prove it to you. We did a whole series on it for six weeks or so, describing the Bible, showing evidence how it has been put together. You can go online and take a look at that. So all scripture, not just some, all scripture. The Old Testament. We don't decouple the Old Testament from the New Testament. The Ten Commandments are valid today. Now, we don't worry about mother's milk and all that kind of thing. Don't, don't um, boil the goat in the mother's milk. That's different. Uh, I'm going to go here just for a second. It's not in my notes, but I'll, I'll do it quickly. Just quickly to help you guys understand this. Well, they mix two different types of uh, yarn together. So, no. There's ceremonial law. Ceremonial law was based on that time. Okay, the ceremonial law. There's also civil law. Civil law is the laws of a nomadic tribe in the desert. But then there's moral law. Moral law, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie. That goes on forever. And so we have to look at the different parts of the Bible and understand what they're there for. But the moral law has not changed. From the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, there's continuity. It's amazing. So you can trust your Bible. So... What's the belt of truth? Well, let's go back and, well, let's go back here. The belt of truth holds it all together. You clip it onto there. That was last week. Today we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. And what this is, by the way, what they would do, they'd, they'd put this breastplate on and it would be metal. It would cover you and this would cover together. And what would happen is they had these little things of metal. And when you began to exercise your, your um, best breastplate, it would actually shine itself. It would become more shiny. In fact, back in the days of antiquity, if you were going to fight an enemy, what you really want to do is you want to have the sun behind you. If the sun's behind you, it would blind the eyes of the enemy, right? So that's what you try to do. But the Romans figured something out. Sometimes they actually had the sun facing, shining on their front. And they had helmets with visors. And what would happen is they would shine and the light would hit their righteousness of their chest piece and it would shine forth and blind the enemy and then they'd take the enemy out. Jesus said, let your good works be seen by all to know that I was sent. You see, our righteousness is how people know who God is, how we act. So we should be shining forth, reflecting the Son of God coming off our righteousness, and that's what we're talking about. Now, the belt of truth is just the Bible. Righteousness is taking the truth and putting it in action. The truth is like seed, but you got to put the seed in the ground to grow the plant. So when you and I start doing what the Bible says, I start forgiving someone that has offended me. Can I just tell you, in the last several weeks, I've been offended perhaps more than I have in a long time. And I've had to uh, let that offense, give it back to God, and not allow it to come to me. When your mother is in the healthcare system and they're not treating her correctly, and when they, uh, when they send her to a rehab facility, within a day they drop her and they break her, break her hip. Let me just tell you right now, I got pretty angry. And the first thing I said, we're going to sue. And I had some kickback from people that I love very much. Well, we can't be doing that. No. I said, you're damn right we're going to sue. Now, how can I say that? Because you know why? We have to stand up for truth. And why would I want to sue? Because I don't want any other older woman or any other person to be mistreated and break their hip in the hospital because they're not paying attention to somebody. The elderly should be treated with respect. Right? So... I'm going to be too transparent here. I got pretty ticked. And let's just say, not only did I turn over the tables, but I started going too far. And I had to repent. All right? I, I, I almost feel like sometimes, like, I want to be real with you guys. I don't want you to think, I, I'm never, <laughs> I'd rather be real and tell you my, my problems than to come across here like I have it all together. I don't have it all together. God does. But I had righteous anger, but what happened is I took it too far. And I had to apologize to my family. Because I don't like what's going on. I don't like passivity, right? 
when, you know, when someone is mistreating my mother or father, I don't like it. Something else happened yesterday that has set me up. At, you know, I, I'm just trying to deal with it. And so I have to take a step back, call my friends. Would you pray for me? Am I being right? You're being right. You have a right to be angry. Be angry and do not sin. And so let me just say that I had an opportunity to work. And I thank God for it because stuff comes up and I act right. And then I go a little too far. Uh, forgive me. Now, there's three people in the mortuary. No, I'm just kidding. That's not, <laughs> <laughs> the police are coming. Nothing like that. But let's just say the people that you love the most, you fight with the most, don't you? So anyhow, it, it's been tough. It's been tough, you know. And, and so what's happening is stuff's coming out of me that I'm realizing I have to deal with. And I want to be righteous. I want to surrender to God. It's not about me, God. It's about you. You know, because it's all, no, it's not about me. God, I want to do what's right. And the, I think the Lord said, you need to fight for your mother and you need to fight this mistreatment. And elder abuse is a problem. The elderly should be treated with respect, right? So I, I feel I'm righteous in this way. Not only do I feel, I know I am. I'm supposed to be a protector. That's my job as a man. I'm supposed to protect my family, right? I'm supposed to protect my parents. That's my job. And so we, so that's a good thing, right? So you have to take it. And so that's righteous. But what can happen is you go too far. So anyhow, that's what can happen. So breastplate is protection for vital organs. What's the vital organs? Here we go, everybody. Above all else, what? Guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So what happens is your heart flows out. Oh, I can't believe that they're bitter. And all of a sudden I have this toxicity in my heart. I think, Lord Jesus, I need a blood transfusion from Jesus. I got toxic blood in me. Lord Jesus, it's not my will. Your will be done. Lord, forgive me right now. Forgive me for going overboard. Lord, I give it to you. And I have to confess my sins to other people, right? Now, I should probably tell you to say two years from now, not two weeks from now. <laughs> but I'd just rather be real, okay? I I'm tired of fake Christianity, and I'm tired of people walking around parading like they have it together. No one has it together. I've seen the highest of the high, and everyone's human. There's only one person that's, one person that's perfect. It's Jesus Christ. So if we start taking off the mask, start being real, then we can actually get healed. You can't get healed if you're not real. Real is being real. Now, you don't be real to everybody. You have to be very selective. But that's how we get healed. We reveal, and then God heals. So above all, confess your sins to one another. Pray for each other that you may be healed. So above all, guard your heart. Everything you do flows from it. So, this is what Jesus says. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, oh, oh. Let me pull that back. Lord, forgive me, right? We all make mistakes. One moment, Peter says, thou art the Christ. Flesh and blood did not tell you that, uh, Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. The next few moments, he says, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So the moment, so that's why we always got to watch our mouth. Who, our whole job of our life is to surrender to Jesus. We need to surrender to Jesus because when we surrender to Jesus, we find freedom. When we don't surrender to Jesus, we find bondage. We find all kinds of nonsense in our lives. So when things crop up in your life, deal with it. See the truth of the scripture. See Jesus. Does it line up? Nope. Okay, time to cut that piece of fat off. And so I have an opportunity to become better and not get bitter. Does that make sense? Okay, so the heart produces good. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you don't like what's coming out of you, check what you're putting in. I just, no, whatever comes out of you is in you. You don't like what you see, that's what you are. The Bible says, scripture's like a mirror. You don't know what you look like until you look in a mirror. And some of you are like, oh boy, I get hit with the ugly stick. Okay, that's okay. We need to look in the mirror, and this is how we adjust ourselves, right? We make sure we're growing the right clothing. We make sure we don't have spinach in our teeth from our omelet this morning, right? You brush your teeth. You comb your hair if you have it. If you don't, you just shave it, okay? <laughs> this is what we do. So we make sure that we have the righteousness of God. Righteousness simply means right living. And it's not just right living from your standpoint. It's God's standards, Righteousness, right living to meet a standard to pass inspection. I got bad news. None of us can pass inspection. Not one of us in this room or anyone in the world. All of us are, all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. That's the good news. The good news is you are all unrighteous. Look at your neighbor says you're unrighteous. 
without Jesus. Okay. Okay. Righteousness guards the most vital parts of your heart. When you choose not to get bitter, when you choose to forgive, when you choose to do the right thing, when you choose not to lust, right? When you choose not to open an, a new dialogue with someone you saw on social media you haven't seen since high school and your husband's not paying enough attention to you and this person's speaking, oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you look so good. Well, thank you. Pray for, will you please pray for my spouse and I'll pray for, you pray for my spouse, I'll pray for your spouse. Look out, that's de deception. This is stuff that happens. It happens all the time. We deceive with little steps. Or you, it's late at night and you're tired and, you, and, and your wife and I are arguing and all of a sudden pops up, something pops up on your phone. Am I going to click on that or not? I'm telling you, this is stuff that happens. We've got to be real, everybody. We have to make sure that we keep ourselves righteous. That's why we need to help each other. We're not here to condemn. There's, no, not, there's not one that's righteous. No, not one. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags according to Scripture. What does that mean then? Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. So righteousness guards him. It guards your way. So when you choose to forgive, when you choose not to get bitter at people when they, dis, when they, mis, when they mistreat your family members, you choose to do what's right, and you let the toxicity of that anger that's too much, and you let it go out. Does that make sense, everybody? I hope you're getting this today, because I need it my, more than you do, right? The enemy's invasion is always started by invitation. Well, that's unforgivable. I'll never forgive that person. What they did for me was so bad. And maybe they did something terrible to you. But the whole that unforgiveness can really hurt you. Graham Cook, one of the, I heard a number of years ago, he's a, a, a pastor that flows in, in, in some of the prophetic ministry, talked about that he was praying for somebody one time in a church. And he got this word, mommies and daddies, didn't know what it was. And he said, I don't know what this means to you, but what does mommy and daddy's mean? And the woman broke down and cried and travailed and they prayed over her and she got healed and she got better after that. And they found out what it was, that mommies and daddies was something that was done to her with family members in the area of abuse. I don't want, don't let me fill it all out. You know what I'm talking about, right? So it was abuse. And so what happened is the enemy used that. What would happen to her is wrong, and they, and they should be prosecuted and arrested and served, and they should be serving prison time. But when you hold on to that toxicity, it destroys you. And so as a result of that, the woman got free, forgave, and prosecuted. That's what needs to happen. Does that make sense, everybody? That's what happens. The enemy's invasion always starts with invitation. You have to hold anger toward that person. You can never forgive that person. What your husband did, and if you keep bringing stuff up all the time about what your husband and wife did, don't do that anymore. Unrighteousness is an invitation for the enemy to attack your life. Listen, I don't, I don't know if you've noticed something, but the other day we had fruit flies in the house. They're annoying. I'm trying to have a pear. I'm trying to have an apple in this thing. Where? I say, it's freezing outside. How do these bugs live? What's going on here, right? These fruit flies. There's an old song about that. I'm not going to sing it. Fruit fly, don't bother me, right? So I'm sitting there and don't know what's going on. So which you can go, you can go to Home Depot. You can buy a, a blue light. You put it in the, in, in the socket. And what it does, it attracts the fruit flies. You put it there overnight. The next day, praise the Lord, look at all these dead fruit flies. Then you want to eat a banana, and there's still more fruit flies. What is, where are they coming from? What makes a fruit fly able to, 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 to persevere is rotten fruit. So when you find that rotten lemon on the bottom where the bananas are, and I threw it out, the fruit flies stopped. Can I hear it? Amen. Okay, so if you got rotten stuff in your life, you attract the enemy. When you allow garbage in your house... When I, I, you can pray all you want, but if you, have, if you have garbage that you don't take out, mice are going to come in, roaches are going to come in, all these varmints are going to come in. If you open the door to the, to, the, to the outside and they smell the garbage, they will come in. The only way you can get free is you can't just manage the trash. you got to get rid of the trash. Yes. I was talking to our architect, Jeffrey Parker, as we are making plans for this place, and he talked about in New York City, they have to have a dumpster inside in a refrigerated place because the rats are as big as cats. And they have to take care of their garbage lest these, these varmints come. So if you have a hospitable environment for that, the enemy will come in. So 
What we need to do is reject the enemy by choosing righteousness. Righteousness is things God's way. And then the enemy can't touch you according to prophet MC Hammer. Okay? Righteousness can be faked, but God nor the enemy is fooled. I could come here today and say, oh, praise God, I have it all together. And I don't have it all together. All right? We got to be real. And so it can be faked. And so righteousness does not save you. A righteous heart saves you. You can have all the right outside acts, but inside you have a horrible ad- attitude. That's why Jesus says, he who lusts after a woman in his heart has already committed adultery. Well, I haven't committed adultery. Are you lusting in your heart? He who hates his brother has already a murderer because everything comes out of here and eventually finds itself here. If you deal with it here, it would never come here. Okay, this is what happens. Righteousness can be fake, but God nor the enemy is fooled. And as this is written, there's not one that's righteous. No, not one. Jesus did not come to help you manage sin. It's not a sin management system. Jesus came to help you have victory over sin. He's come to destroy the cancer of sin. He doesn't want to negotiate with it. You cannot negotiate with a terrorist. And the enemy is a terrorist. And he sends his terrorist cells in your life through thoughts, actions, and ideas. And when you see that terrorist cell come, you have to get a bazooka of God's word and you got to blast it into oblivion. When you can take your sword of the spirit and chop its head off, you cannot tolerate sin in your life. Now, don't worry about your neighbor's life and sin. You worry about you. And then you'll be able to work in a humble way when you realize how much you need God. Jesus came to help you have victory over sin. So righteousness is first embraced, not earned. You cannot earn it. All of us are a hopeless wreck without Jesus. None of us are good enough. If you were to ask me right now, I want you to jump here to the moon. Maybe some of you can jump this high. I can jump this high, right? Can any of us jump to the moon? Only if you go on Elon Musk rocket, but he'll have to propel you, right? No, none of us can get there. None of us can do it. None of us can swim to here to England, right? All of us So righteousness is first embraced, not earned. You cannot earn it. Now, do we have a responsibility? Yes, we'll talk about it in a few moments. Righteousness is both imputed and imparted. What's imputed mean? Imputed means it's something that's been credited to your account. Imagine that you're trying to pay bills and you go in your online and you look, oh my Lord, I got $100,000. Where did that $100,000 come from? Wow, you'd be pretty excited, wouldn't you? If I told you today, I have a million dollars that I had buried in your backyard, but you gotta find it. How many of you would get a shovel? (laughs) Yeah, right? God has given us billions of dollars in the spirit, but we have to take the shovel and get rid of the stuff that's not supposed to be there. You gotta shovel away the stuff, right? Righteousness is both imputed and imparted. So God gives us the account of righteousness and he gives us more righteousness when we need it. You see? What does that mean? Imputed is given to us at the moment of salvation. We are justified. Justified means just as if I've never sinned. Justified means just if I never sinned. When you give your life to Jesus, God looks at you through Jesus Christ. When you surrender your life to God, God, I give you my life. I give you my sins. God washes you completely. And God looks at you like he looks at Jesus. That's the beautiful thing of the cross. Jesus took our place. He took the electric chair. He took the lethal injection. He took it for us. So you and I would not have to do it. That's the beauty. And so our righteousness does not come from ourselves. It comes from Jesus and he's given it to us. For he, that's Jesus, made him who knew no sin. So this is all of our sin. God took all of his sin and put it on Jesus and took it. And Jesus took all of his righteousness and put it to us. For he made him who knew no sin to what? Be sin for us that we might become. Not that we would have. No, we become the righteousness of God. Look what your neighbor said. If you're in Christ, you're righteous. Become the righteousness of God. Not of cornerstone, not of a denomination, but of Christ. To become the righteousness of God in him, that being Jesus. You see, 
himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that's the cross, and we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So that's what we're called to do. So what's happened is this. We are imparted. We want to work out every day after salvation, sanctification. So I want to work out what God's worked into me. Let, let me give you an illustration. We've used this a lot, but imagine this is you. You have, your, you have your body, you have your soul and your spirit. Your body is your body. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Then you have your spirit. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, immediately the Holy Spirit is in you and imparts in you. You are perfect because the Holy Spirit's there inside, in your spirit. And so our objective is to be filled with the spirit, right? And we ask, Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So what we wanna do is get rid of the boulders. We wanna let the spirit of God begin to change our mind, to change our will, to change our emotions. The standard of Christ is right there. We have to work out what God has worked in. This is our job. So does the outside affect the inside? Yes, but much more effective is to change the inside and it will eventually be on the outside. You can fake this other stuff, but you can't fake this. That's why it says in Philippians, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now check this out. Therefore, my beloved, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, yeah, God's word has to be worked out. Pay attention to God's word. If you don't pay attention to God's word, you're gonna hurt yourself and other people. You work out what God has put in you. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God. The Holy Spirit's telling you to forgive that person. The Holy Spirit's telling you to call someone to get some help. The Holy Spirit's telling you not to get bitter towards the health, in <laughs> health industry, but just hire a lawyer instead, praise God. Okay. For it is God who works in you both the will and to do his good pleasure. Anything you want to do for God is from God. So when you see God in you, thank you, God, and stand out, stand in that. We've been reading through Moses, and God says, I, you're a great deliverer, but I stutter. I stutter, God. And he says, no, I'll put the, who made the mouth? And, and Moses refused to believe God, so he had to have Aaron. And Aaron became a lot of trouble. You need to believe God's word. God has sanctified me. I'm cleansed. I can do all things through Christ and start walking it through. What happens if I fall? Get back up. Believe God's word above everything else. So we want to work out what God has worked in. There's a great man by the name of Chuck Colson. The political landscape in our country changed dramatically after the Watergate deceptions that took place with Richard uh, with uh, Nixon. What happened was this, prior to Watergate, prior to Richard Nixon and all this that took place, the media protected the government. They would not all tell the presidents the stuff they did, like John F. Kennedy and others, they, they hid that stuff and they, they wanted to make the country look good and respect their leaders. But when Watergate happened, something shifted in our country. Now, down with the man, down with the government, right? And so, and this is, he was called, Chuck Colson was called the hatchet man Dirty trickster. Now, that's him. Now, do you want to mess with this dude? It looks like trouble, right? I don't know what he's smoking there, but whatever he's smoking. He, so what he would do, he was called the hatchet man. He would make things happen for Nixon. Don't worry, Nixon. I'll take care of it. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do, but I'll take care of it. Well, when the Watergate happened, he was thrown in prison. Brilliant man. Very well educated. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. He wrote a book called Born Again. And he started a prison fellowship. He became an amazing man of God. One of the greatest minds of the last century. Brilliant man. Very smart man. Uh, made a great impact for Christ. He went from this to the other. Why? He gave up his life to Jesus Christ. This is what he said. Christ's transformation power is unparalleled. When we open our hearts to him, we experience a radical change that goes beyond our own efforts. It's not about self-improvement, but a complete renewal from the inside out. Christ's love and grace have the extraordinary ability to turn our lives around, offering redemption, purpose, and a new direction. This is what God has for us. 
But we must be willing to say, I am surrendering to Jesus. I'm surrendering my pain. I'm surrendering my anchor. I'm surrendering my shame. And I'm going to go under Jesus. And whatever he says I will do, everything else is negotiable except Jesus and his righteousness. And it's his righteousness in me coming out of me that makes me righteous. And without him, I can do absolutely nothing. That's the position you and I need to take. So, let the Spirit renew you. And this is why I want to conclude with this. How do you, you want to keep your spirit clean? Whatever you feed leads. What are you feeding on? Anger, frustration, negativity, watching the news from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night. I tell you, you'll be a negative person. Be informed, but don't just sit there and drink it all, all day long. Right? Whatever you feed leads and grows. Also, what you starve stalls. You want to you get free? Don't. You want to get free of lust? Fill it with something else. Starve it. Starve it. Don't feed it and it will die. You want to replace, not stop. Replace, not stop. And why changing, you make it right. Also, what entertains you, trains you. This is an issue, everybody. The music today is blankety blank, 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 blank with a nice beat. I'm going to blank, 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 blank. That's, that's pretty much the music today. I like to listen to podcasts. Now they're dropping F-bombs and every, I, you know, I can't listen to it anymore. I don't care how pithy and smart, I can't fill my mind with that junk anymore, right? What entertains you, trains you. If you're around angry people, you'll become angry. We want to change ourselves. So feed your spirit equals righteousness. Feed your flesh, it means rottenness. What you feed leads. Understand that you've been bought by Jesus Christ. You have a un tapped river of life called the Holy Spirit inside of you. Our objective is to get the Spirit of God to flood every area of our lives. And what I, what I need help sometimes, I get boulders there. So I can pray for my friend. Hey, hey, um, can you please help me, Kevin? I got this boulder of bitterness towards this situation. I want to confess it to you. And he'll help me lodge that thing out of there. And all of a sudden, the, the, the river comes out more. And then I can see something in Kevin. You see, I'm just using him as an example because he can take it, I hope. Uh, if he's not here next week, that's what happened, okay? So that's what begins to happen. Or a Pastor Tom. I can tell something to Pastor Tom in the back. And he helps me dislodge something. And I help something to dislodge from him. And together we're better. And what happens is by being in small groups, by helping each other, we let the Spirit of Christ inside of us come out of us and the righteousness of God and not ourselves makes us strong. So, are you willing to put on the breastplate of righteousness? It's not enough to know the truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free if you practice the truth. And truth is not truth until you practice it. Take the seeds of the word, plant it in the soil of your heart, exercise, let that breastplate get shinier and shinier, and let the light of Christ blind the enemy, and let us take the hill together in Jesus' name. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, all of us here desperately need you, God. I need you. And Father, we recognize that it's your righteousness that protects our hearts and protects our internal organs. It protects us from dying of toxology and being, being poisoned, Father. It is your breastplate of righteousness. And so, Lord, we have the belt of truth on. We want to hook it there. But, Father, we don't just want to quote Scripture. We want to live Scripture by doing what you called us to do. Father, I pray you would connect us as a platoon of Roman soldiers together, Father, that we would take the hill of our families, take the hills of our communities, take the hills of our middle schools and high schools and colleges. And, Father, we would take the hill of our workplace by being righteous and humble and strong. Father, we know that you can take 120 people and change the world. We have more than that right here today. If we would submit ourselves to you and submit ourselves to your word, there's nothing impossible for you in Jesus' name. Lord, forgive us for making excuses. There is no excuse. Sin has to die. In Jesus, you took our sin on the cross. We want to transfer our trash to you so we can have your righteousness on our lives. In Jesus' name.